Well, here we are at my computer screen. Welcome aboard. Uh, we're looking uh, at a nice clear view of that graph I was waving at the camera. And this gives you a chance to see uh, what I was talking about. Um, this is a fascinating graphic that I had not seen before because it is filled with useful information. Let me take you on a short tour so you understand what we're talking about here. Over here is flight speed in the handy dandy units of meters per second. I guess if I were in Europe, uh, that'd be great. But I have a brain that was educated decades ago and I am stuck in imperial units. And knots don't do me any good either because I don't sail sailboats much. Or other boats. So um, I've had to convert to those horrible units of feet per second um, and then plotted my aircraft, uh, the Klingberg Wing Mark II, on uh, these curves. And over here we have Mach number. Obviously, that doesn't apply to what we're talking about here. I'm way down here in the no, you're not flying fast region. And across the bottom we have Reynolds numbers. And uh, keep in mind that these are order of magnitude increments here on the graphic. So here's 100,000, here's 1 million, here's 10 million. Okay, so the interesting thing is, is they plot a lot of fascinating types of aircraft on here. And this plot only eliminates or ignores one interesting area uh, and I couldn't find one of these that had everything on it, uh, but this does not include human-powered aircraft. And human-powered aircraft kind of live in this zone right in here. Um, that's below sailplanes, uh, somewhere down around hang gliders, and uh, doesn't ever get close to general aviation stuff. Uh, but my glider is at times on parts of the glider operating in a zone that human-powered airplanes operate in. Okay, so, oh, supersonic, transonic, interesting. Stokes flow. Stokes flow is a very interesting topic. I'm not going to attempt to describe it here, but you can go on Wikipedia and look up Stokes flow. Uh, it might be under Reynolds number and uh, uh, read up on it. It's quite fascinating. It has to do with uh, where flow just goes like totally laminar. Uh, and you can often see it uh, with the smoke coming off of uh, a match that you've blown out. Dust particles. I've never seen dust particles plotted before. Quite interesting. Way down here at the, <laughs> at the origin of the graph. And uh, this pretty much explains why dust particles just float around in the air. You know, they never seem to settle to the ground. Uh, and it's because, really, what it's because of, to a dust particle... The air is like soup, uh, very viscous, and it's like stuck in it, and it can't go up, can't go down. The air moves around, takes the dust with it. Uh, fascinating. Anyway, so I've plotted my aircraft on here, and I've also plotted the, uh, the killer barrier here. Uh, this is the laminar separation bubble limit. It's generally agreed that when you go to the left of the dashed line you are risking laminar separation bubbles and to the right you probably have a turbulent boundary layer and uh, everything is peachy um, this may or may not be true depending upon the selection of airfoil if you pick a low reynolds number airfoil it's going to have a little bit more margin here that it will operate just fine without laminar separation bubbles uh, and uh, you might actually have some low Reynolds number airfoils that are specifically designed to trip the flow at a certain point uh, to ensure that you know a certain portion of the airfoil has turbulent boundary layer so those are special cases uh, but here I am uh, let's see root stall the root of my wing is right about 1 million um, at stall speed which is 23 miles an hour for me so I've plotted here this is my essentially my root cord is right here the size of my root cord and the speed that i'm flying at from over here and we end up right there just below general aviation there's probably some ultralights that fly down in this region but well to the right of 
uh, standard hang gliders. Uh, and thankfully, to the right of the dashed line. And it, it is true, what we've seen from the Tufts in flight and all the video we have, the root of my wing is well behaved. Uh, the flow doesn't seem to do anything crazy down there. Uh, and that would be in the region where the flaps are. Okay, so out at the wing tip, uh, at the very tip of my wing, at stall speed, I'm over here, smack dab in the hang glider zone, the hang glider bubble here. Now, this hang glider bubble might not be correct anymore because there's some hang gliders that have expanded this region. They fly faster. Uh, they got a skinnier wing. Uh, so this bubble might be a little bit larger. Uh, but here's where I reside. I plotted my tip cord on here. 24 inches and I'm right there um, and that Reynolds number for me is 400,000 at stall so my wing tip is flying uh, in what is really um, can't really call it hazardous we'll call it a problematic zone might have laminar separation bubbles might not Depends on how it goes. How smooth is your airfoil? Uh, does it uh, is it a rough surface to start with? Well, that's probably tripping the flow, and you have a turbulent boundary layer. Uh, is it glass smooth like a sailplane? Here's sailplanes plotted up here. They fly faster, um, and they have laminar flow airfoils. So, and they're super smooth, and they might just stay laminar all the way back to where the control surfaces are. So. And so my wingtips are flying in the hang glider region, uh, but the big difference is hang gliders use wing warping for control. I have elevons. That's two different animals. And usually the aft portion of a hang glider, unless you have a 100% double surface, the aft portion of the wing uh, is a flat plate. It's just a one layer of fabric. Uh, so that can actually be beneficial. Thinner airfoils do better at low Reynolds numbers. But I have a fairly thick airfoil at 12%. And flying here at 400,000 Reynolds number in a hang glider zone. But really, it's a rigid wing. So with, with control surfaces. Not really comparable to a hang glider in terms of analyzing this problem. But we know that... I have an issue because, look, the root of my wing is on the right-hand side of the dashed line. The tip of my wing is on the left-hand side of the dashed line. So that means part of my glider is operating in a normal turbulent boundary layer zone, and part of my wing is operating over here where you might have issues with laminar separation, which I think is what's actually occurring. So how do we uh, deal with this problem? Well, we can add vortex generators. Uh, and that'll trip the boundary layer and uh, keep it turbulent. That doesn't increase the Reynolds number. It just uh, pulls energy from the free stream down into the boundary layer and helps the boundary layer stay attached. Uh, and So that doesn't actually move that part of the wing to the right side of the dashed line, where we'd kind of like to be. And uh, But it does uh, help the flow conditions. The problem with vortex generators is when you want to go fast, uh, they're not helping. They're just generating a bunch of drag that holds you back. Um, and, and it would be nice if you could retract them for higher speed flight. Now, the Swift, it has a 36-inch tip cord. Uh, so that puts them over here. At stall speed, the Swift is operating right about where the root of my wing is operating at stall. So it does just fine. And in addition, they have a low Reynolds number airfoil on the Swift, which I'm going to talk about later. And uh, it is specifically set up so that the uh, flow is tripped at a particular point, goes turbulent boundary layer, and stays well attached. Uh, their drawback is that airfoil is designed specifically for low speeds. And uh, for that era of hang gliders, it was fine. But if you want to go fast, uh, it's not a go-fast airfoil. Uh, gets pretty draggy. Uh, and that's been proven out in the... Uh, class two competitions in Europe, that if it's a strong day, the Aerioptrix will win. And if it's a weak day and you need to fly slow and float around in thermals, then the Swift wins. Uh, because the Swift uh, is really designed 
to operate best at the low speed region and the Arioptrix will fly faster. I, on the other hand, want to be able to do both. I want to be able to fly really slow and go fast. Now the flaps help with that somewhat, but I am looking at a speed range of a factor of five, from 20 miles an hour to 100 miles an hour, and a factor of five on your flyable speed range without significant uh, reshaping of the wing via various systems like slats or slotted flaps or something like that is very difficult to achieve. Airliners do that type of, uh, of factor of five. You know, their their landing speeds are down around 150, 180 miles an hour, and they cruise at close to 600. Uh, so they have that kind of range, but they totally disassemble the wing and make it, they morph it into this huge cambered thing in order to land. And then to go fast, they suck it all up, then get a super critical airfoil and away they go. Obviously, I cannot afford all the weight and complexity of doing that with my wing. So going to have to do something, either eat the fact that we're going to have to create turbulence on the surface with vortex generators and uh, that would kind of limit the high speed end. It's actually just wouldn't limit the high speed end, it just ruins the performance at the high speed end. Or um, increase the cord of the wing. I can increase the cord of the tip and move the Reynolds number to the right. And uh, I would have to increase it about eight inches up to 32 inches uh, to get it over right on the line there. So at least the tips would be operating here at the dashed line and the roots over here and probably all be peachy. Uh, but obviously a change to the cord of my wing is a major modification. Uh, changing the taper, that would move the aerodynamic center. Uh, Got to move the pilot then. Oh my goodness, it's like a whole new aircraft then. Um, so we're going to continue to explore options of uh, dealing with this uh, situation and uh, uh, see if we can come up with a novel solution that will prevent uh, laminar separation bubbles, keep the flow attached, give me good control. And uh, I think we might have some interesting solutions and new knowledge that's coming up here uh, later in the video. So I hope you hang in there and watch this whole huge long soap opera of an aircraft design and i appreciate you hanging in there with me and the pun is certainly intended so uh for now uh think about this and uh, i'll start working on the uh, next segment of the video